Welcome back, Chappelle. All right, so I'm coming to you right now from scenic Miss Bashman's room across the hall in the art classroom. You want to say hi, Miss Bashman? Hey. All right, so y'all are right now over in S period, right? Uh, going, watching chit chat and whatnot. Let me know if I was in it. Um, but the big thing is, we left off talking in class about a lot of these different cultural ideas, stories, things that are going to occur in the Roman, surprisingly enough, mostly in the kingdom, somewhat in the Republic period, but we haven't even got to that yet, right? We haven't even got to this point of like splitting up Rome into its time periods and talking about its chronology because we right now are talking about all the major things and stories and legends and myths that kind of affect the idea that is Rome, right? The idea of a super organized military, the idea of being founded by these two twins that are gonna symbolize with civil war as well as geographic territory on the seven hills of Rome, right? We talked about all these other different things. Oh, Cincinnatus and the concept of a dictator that leaves and gives power back to the people eventually, right? So these are all very, very important things that we've been bringing up this entire time. And it's very important that you understand that we're just kind of still going over these major themes. But today in class, we talked about the Gallic invasion of Rome, right? The Gauls are gonna invade Rome in about 309 BC. And the Gauls are a group of people called barbarians, right? We talked about the origin of the word barbarian. We talked about how it comes from the Latin word Berber, which means to babble, and how that actually is gonna become like just a later on is gonna evolve into a term meaning simple or uncivilized, but how it originally started out as just a word because the Romans couldn't understand what they were saying, right? Our should be on for chat. Our students should be seated and quiet. Enjoy the show. <laughs> as I'm sure you are, right? So when we talked about that today in class, we talked about how like the Gauls are gonna hold Rome ransom for a thousand pounds of gold, and Brennus, the Gallic leader, is going to drop his sword onto the scale and say, woe be to the fallen, right? We talked about that whole big story. There were some geese involved and all this other crazy stuff, and we'll go back over little bits and pieces of it and stuff like that in class, do not worry. But the main thing about it though is Rome has now been put into check, right? So Rome, before the Gallic invasion, was that cocky boy in high school that thought they were awesome, right? But now, since they have been destroyed by an outside barbaric tribe, they have been put into check, and it has now become fully aware, Rome has become fully aware of their place in society, that they are not yet the strong, super militaristic, hyper intense empire that they will one day grow into be. And a lot of it starts with organizing your military because keep this in mind, Rome, you fell to these guys, right? Pictured on the screen right now is a Gallic warrior, right? Or a Gaul barbarian using like a simple wooden shield, maybe some smaller iron tools like a sword or a spear, right? But this is not a super advanced individual, right? But because they fell to these group of barbarians, Rome is gonna decide to organize its military, right? And they're going to hyper organize it. It's gonna force Rome to create one of their most basic unit, the idea of the unit known as the Legion, right? The Legion, which is about four to 6,000 men give or take, depending on how many casualties or if they were in a recent battle or whatever. Ideally, it's about 5,500 though, right? And they all are split into different, like, different cohorts, right? So you would actually see like smaller groups of field soldiers or light troops. There were units of cavalry. There were units of reserves, right? You saw like one cohort was six centuries. A century was about 80 soldiers. And each soldier was called a legionary, right? So, but they became hyper-organized. That's the key thing to remember here. You do not need to write down this entire graph. You do not need to know exactly how many units they had. But what you do need to know is because the Gauls invaded and destroyed Rome and sacked it in 309 BC, that the Romans are going to organize their military, which is gonna give them the ability to go out and take over these huge swaths of land later on, right? To grow into an empiric state when they actually have the ability to grow and mass and extend their empire to reaches of all of Italy and then even later to most of Rome, right? Now, as they conquer and as they grow, Rome is going to start extending citizenship to some of these conquered people, right? They're gonna let them keep their customs, they're gonna let them keep their religion, they're gonna have to pay allegiance to Rome and pay their taxes, but several of them are gonna be even extended citizenship, which was a major theme of Roman society, right? When we talked about Romulus and Remus and how Romulus is gonna stab Remus to get death and now that's a symbol of civil war we also took two seconds in class today to talk about how romulus then opened rome up to prisoners runaway slaves to all these vagabonds of italy to allow them to come and exist there and become romans right because roman citizenship was an abstract uh, abstract idea that included members of the entire areas of which they took over not necessarily just 
the people from the original Rome. Understanding of like why they extended so far, why they became so strong, is remember, again, this is a Gallic warrior, right? This is one of the barbarians, quote unquote, that the Romans were going to be coming into contact with when they organized their military. So people like this are the ones that they're going to start going into contact with. However, this is what a Roman legionary looked like at the height of the Empiric period. So as you can see, just looking at these two people comparatively, yes, the Gallic warrior looks more intimidating. Yes, he looks larger. Yes, he looks like he might win in a fight. But keep in mind, look at the technology that Roman legionaries were wielding, right? You've got chainmail armor, completely metal, like iron armor base, iron based helmets, iron based swords, an iron based sword known as a gladius that we'll talk about here in a second. And also the technology of the Roman military far out, see, out exceeded the technology of the barbarian groups throughout Europe. I need you to write that down. Yes, they extended citizenship. Yes, they organized their units into legions, right? But they also created military technology that no one had access to throughout the rest of Europe, right? So just go ahead and jot down. Military technology, very important in ancient Rome, right? And if you want to jot down a couple of these things, it's completely fine. You don't necessarily have to jot down all of them, though. It's not that important. You just need to know that they had extreme forms of iron weapons, right? For example, this thing right here is called a pugia, right? A pugia is actually a small dagger that a Roman legionary would carry as a sidearm, right? This right here is a Roman gladius, right? An actual long Roman sword that they would use in their legionaries. It was their main weapon of choice. Other like other types of Roman soldiers, here we go. Some of the ones that were known as lancers or that were foot soldiers would actually use this thing called a pilum, right? Which is a wooden shaft spear. They would also use javelins and other projectile objects, but then they also invented the very first crossbows, which only like the barbarians of Europe. Hi, Jamie. You want to come say hi? You're now in your own flip. It's like Inception. You're going to be watching yourself. Future Jamie, just remember that you have more homework than you think you do. I agree. All right, that's good advice to everyone from Future Jamie. All right, so now, anyway, but the big thing about, or not, from past Jamie, that's past Jamie, right? Past. That's past Jamie. All right, so pay me. So pay me is letting you all know that you have more homework than you realize. All right, so the very first crossbows are going to be developed by the Roman military, right? Well, the Roman military, ironically enough, is coming into contact with barbarians that could only use composite bows, which was not nearly as technologically advanced. This is a Roman cavalry helmet completely made out of iron, right? They also came up with these different styles of weapons as well. The Romans invented the very first catapults, which is massively important, which is a siege weapon. And they're going to be able to use these to heavily knock down forces of barbarian groups, using it to launch these things known as payloads. But the favorite thing of the Roman military to launch at their enemies was actually flaming pots of combustible oil, right? Like an actual gunk that was inside a petroleum-based oil that was inside of a large clay pot. They would light it on fire and then launch it, and it would actually explode onto the ground, burning anybody that was nearby, right? The Romans also invented the very first things called ballistas, right? This ballista right here, imagine it being a giant crossbow that took two men to operate, which could launch anything, including bolts, which is actually these massive arrows that they could launch that could actually kill a human being very easily, and or it would launch other rocks and other projectile objects, and it could launch them several hundred yards, right? So no barbarian like army stood a chance in the face of the Roman military. Also, not to mention the fact that when you heard the Roman military showing up like with these things on their feet, these things are called caligas, they're the boots that they would wear. They had hobnails all over the underside of them. You can actually see, if you look really, really closely, the underside of the Roman military shoe called a caliga right, or Calgia, would actually have these little metal lumps all over the bottom that you could use to stomp on any person that you were actually coming in contact with. It also kept your feet protected during battle. Also, there you go, Sarah, right? Got to keep those toes, toesies protected, right? And then the other big thing about it is also imagine the idea of a Roman military coming down a stone Roman road, which we're about to talk about here in about two seconds, and actually hearing the noise of a five thousand Roman troops marching all in sync with those metal shoes on the bottoms of their feet, right? The thunder would be unreal. And speaking of things that had to do with a uh, like foot injury, these are also a very, very popular Roman to tool called a cata, cata oh God, I can't remember what it's called, but it starts with see, I think it's like a catacult. And these things would actually be laid out on the field and horses would run over them and uh, get out of my room, Bailey. I have a sub in there. So anyway, now, nope, nope, Bailey, Bailey, keep moving. 
All right, so anyway, now, but the big thing about it is <clears throat> these things actually horses would step on them and other barbarian troops would actually like step on them and actually it was a defensive weapon. So going forward though, by about 200 BC, give or take, uh, the Romans are gonna extend their power to most of the Italian peninsula and they're gonna conquer basically what you refer to as modern day Italy. Okay? So they're going to establish colonies throughout other parts of the ancient world as well. They're going to start actually establishing colonies off the coast of Italy, some of the smaller islands, and even all the way far as like the south of Spain, right? So the Romans following the destruction by the Gauls, I know this seems weird, but like, just let me do my thing. All right, so anyway, now, so by about like, it, wait, hold on, Gauls, rollbacks, Skylar sister, what's up? All right, so, um, but anyway, now, big thing is though, the Romans, following their destruction by the Gauls, are going to create that hyper-organized military with a lot of military technology, and they're going to be able to conquer large swaths of land very, very quickly. Because if you actually think about it for two seconds, the Gauls showed up in 309 BC, and within a hundred years, the Romans now conquered all of Italy. So that turning point is majorly, majorly important, right? And speaking of, since they're now taking over this massive amount of land, it's very important to understand that as you take over land, what are you gonna do with it? How are you gonna change it? How are you gonna use it to the best of your efficability, right? And so what the Romans are gonna do is they're gonna build roads all over it, right? They're gonna build these massive imperial roads that span the entirety of every bit of land that they actually take over. Now, some of these roads weren't super advanced. They were just like warm patches of grass. Some of these roads were hyper advanced though and actually made out of stone and layers of sand. It actually looked like this. And again, imagine for a second, a legion of Roman military like members, 5,000 men marching in unison on one of those roads with those calicas on their feet, right? It's a very intimidating thing. And there's a very famous saying that actually goes in line with this. Crawford, do you remember this saying? All roads what? All roads lead to Rome. Heck yeah, good job. Proverb, write that down, right? All roads lead to Rome. Basically referring to the fact that the Roman road network, as they began to take over all this area, was so sophisticated that you could simply follow one of these roads all the way back to the mother city itself of Rome, right? So very, very important that we understand that. All roads lead to Rome, all right? So, and when we're talking about Roman history, now we're going to be getting into the actual chronological sense of Rome, right? We talked a lot just now about important historical things, stories, ideas that kind of encapsulate the culture of Rome, right? We talked about Romulus and Remus being the founders, right? We talked about the actual founders more than likely being the Latins um, and how that, that's the origin of their actual names and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We talked about how Rome started out as a very simple village of mud huts and grossness and how it's gonna evolve into this massive empire, right? We talked about also the Gauls are gonna invade. We also talked about since Cincinnatus actually being the very first successful dictator. All these little things, though, they didn't necessarily happen in order. And we were mainly talking about these stories to kind of give you a little bit of context of the cultural aspects of Rome, right? Where these ideas of the dictator came from, where the ideas of civil war are going to have their roots in their founding story, where these ideas of a sophisticated military are going to come, because it's a reaction to being destroyed by the Gauls in 309 BC, right? So the Roman military, or excuse me, the Roman historical record doesn't have nearly as many time periods as Greece did, right? When we talked about Greece, we were talking about the eight time periods of Greece. Neolithic, Early Bronze, Minoan, Mycenaean, Dark Ages, Archaic, Classical, Hellenistic, right? Rome's a lot easier. It's actually broken into just three different phases. It's the Kingdom period, which actually spans right around when we believe Romulus and Remus would have founded Rome, right? It's from 753 to about 510 BC, when they then invented their very new fancy government, right? Very important because that enters the Republic period. We're going to talk about that a little bit today as well. And then it's going to move, and that's going to go from 509 to 29 BC, right after the Ides of March, right after the grandnephew of Julius Caesar yes, himself is going to take over and turn Rome into what is known as the Roman Empire, right? Led by one autonomous leader known as the Emperor, actually originally known as the Imperator, which is a big title bestowed upon a Roman like military general, but we'll get to that stuff later on, right? So these are the three time periods of Rome. And it's like really important that you understand that, yes, when we were analyzing Roman history just now, we had to jump around a lot. And we're still going to need to jump around just a little bit, right? We're still going to need to jump around and kind of understand these different things. Because the big thing about it is like when we were talking about these four major events, Romulus stabbed Remus in 753, right? And then we talked about the fact that Cincinnatus and his dictatorship is going to be in 458. But then we also talked about the Gallic sacking of Rome, which happened in 309. But some of the very first roads built by Rome were actually built about 10 years earlier. Right? So we did jump around a lot, but all those stories are very important to understand. And most of those stories come from the kingdom period, right? So, well, actually, 
all most of them come from the Republic period. That's not true. But like one of them comes from the Kingdom period, which is really important to understand. Uh, but the big thing though going forward, yes, we've been jumping around, but we are still going to continue to jump around a little bit. But now we're going to focus on the Roman Republic, right? The Republic period and the period that defines them governmentally, societally, and kind of just really spans the swath of their entire, uh, like their civilization. And really kind of gives us understanding. Like if you don't understand the Republic period, you'll never understand the roads that Rome went down. See what I did there? See what I did there, Crawford? Get it? The roads that Rome went down? Because what? Because all roads lead what? Lead Rome. I better have gotten some laughs on the other end of that. Wait, Crawford, but do you remember the four letters that symbolize Rome? S what? S P Q R. Thank you, Ms. Bashman. Yes, all right, so boom, right there, right? Right on your screen right there. S P Q R are the four letters that symbolize Rome culturally as a whole, mainly relating to their Republican style government. The thing that they would tout against barbarians, saying that you are nowhere near civilized as Rome because you do not have the same Republican government that Rome has, right? SPQR is such a prevalent thing in Roman society that it's plastered all over the city. It's on manhole covers, and it's on walls, and it's on streets, and it's everywhere. You can buy shirts that say it. There are people in Rome that have tattoos of SPQR. Now, some of you are like, well, what does SPQR stand for? Uh -uh. So, like, yes, like, Scott Roulette's sister sitting right here as, like, was wondering, well, what the heck does SPQR stand for? Well, SPQR stands for Senatus Populusque Romanum, right? There's supposed to be P-O-P -P right there, Populusque Romanum, which literally translates from Latin into the Roman Senate and people, right? So, obviously, as we can tell, the identity of Rome is going to be held within their government, right? So, it is important to understand that. But where does their government emanate from, right? I know a lot of you are like, well, it's probably Palatine Hill, right? Because didn't you say that's a word for modern-day palace? Well, yeah, but the Palatine Hill was going to eventually hold the house of the emperor, right? So that comes much later. All of the yeah, Roman... Do what? Palpatine. Palpatine? Yeah, the Emperor Palpatine, the Star Wars character, right? Do it. <laughs> so, but I have to show you a video actually later. It's hilarious. But uh, the big thing about it, though, the Roman Republic kind of emanates from this particular epicenter in Rome. Every Roman city and colony would have one of these, but this one is the main one. This is the Forum of Rome, right? F-O-R-U-M, the Forum. Write it down. It's very important. The Forum of Rome. And ironically enough, the Forum of Rome, we believe, was built right around circa 500 B.C., right when their Republican government started, right? When their Republican, when their Republic begins, the forum is constructed, right? What the forum used to be was actually a cemetery. Like in the kingdom period when Romulus and Remus first arrived in this area, it was a kind of a marshy area and really kind of gross. And where the forum actually is currently built was originally something that one would consider kind of like a bog, right? A lot of that due to the fact that the Tiber River would swell and flood repeatedly. Now we know that for early Roman settlements, that was a good thing because it deposited silt and volcanic ash into the soil, revitalizing the dirt and actually making it very good for farming but it doesn't really make good for building large structures on top of, right? So once the Roman Republic period arrives, they began to build walls that would hold the Tiber back a little bit, right? Dam, like actually, like, yeah, those would be like dam walls that would hold up the Tiber back a little bit and they would drain the Forum out to a touch and then they actually had to move some bodies because the original use of the Roman Forum was a cemetery. And actually, it's one of the biggest archaeological dig sites still to this day when it has to do with Roman, uh, Roman history because we're still finding like dead bodies and stuff, like layers and layers and layers deeper in the Roman Forum, right? And this is what the Forum looks like now. The Roman Forum, though, is massively important. If you ever get a chance to go, you definitely should because this is me standing in the Roman Forum. Hey, hey. Where are these ch random children walking in my room? Like, so anyway... But the big thing is, this is me standing in the Roman Forum, right? So I've been there before. It's an epicenter of Roman culture, right? If you're actually talking about where, like, we can see Roman culture everywhere, but the true heartbeat of Rome lies within the dirt of the Forum, right? And so this is me, of course, because I don't know what to do with my face, and I never know how to smile for pictures. And this is me and my wife actually standing in the Roman Forum, and this is the face that she makes whenever I won't stop talking about history stuff. So, like, this right here, though, is one of my favorite pictures, because this is also a really important thing. These were constructed inside of the Roman Forum regularly. So that is a victory arch. That particular one is the Arch of Titus, right? So that is actually the arch that was erected when the Romans took over Jerusalem, 
right? When they actually took over Jerusalem and subjugated the Jewish people that lived there, they're actually inside of the walls right here. You can see Romans bringing back their uh, spoils of victory, right? They're actually bringing back menorahs and they're bringing back huge swaths of gold and they're bringing all these things that they found when they took over Jerusalem. And every time they would take somebody over, they would erect an arch, right? And what arch that is very, very famous that exists in Paris is actually modeled off of a Roman arch, the Arc de what? The Arc de Triomphe. Yeah, exactly. The Arc de Triomphe, right? Like these arches, this, this architectural concept is something that has emanated throughout of all of Western society. As you can tell, I'm a huge Rome dork. All right. So like, but the big thing going forward also is the, the forum also served as kind of the epicenter of places where people could live. People had apartment style dwellings that actually lined the edges of the forum. People who were poor, middle class, like former slaves that had been freed, lived in these tiny little apartment style dwellings that I'm actually standing on the bottom floor of one of them right there. You can see me looking up, right, looking at the wall, and you can see where the beams would have gone to separate the floor of one apartment from the one, from the floor, from this, wait, no, the ceiling of one apartment from the floor of the one above it. So jot that down really quick as well. A lot of Romans lived in these like apartment style dwellings, right? So going forward, that also going back to the arch picture real quick, everything by finds this really funny. Looking at this picture, that's not my arm. That's like this Swedish guy in front of me's leg. Like I know it looks like for a second that it looks like that's my arm, but that's a shoe and where it looks like my arm would actually be. It ruins that picture for me, but I absolutely love that picture. And they're my, some of my favorite pictures because I'm not actually looking at the camera because I actually hate it when I look at the camera because I go from looking like this to looking like this and looking disgusting, right? So, but there's a couple of other things you need to know when we're talking about the Roman Republic. There are like four words you need to know, okay? So go ahead and jot these four words down, okay? I'm gonna ask you to, ooh, whoa, let's make me smaller actually. There we go. Like, I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and jot these words down, okay? Go ahead and pause me real quick. Jot these words down, they're very important. And then unpause me and I'll explain it real quick, okay? So, pause. Okay, so now that you had a chance to like actually write those things down, okay? So the Republic and why it's so important to Rome is a Republic is some kind, it's a type of government that had never existed in the ancient world leading up to the era of Rome, right? A Republic is a government that is ruled by a chosen number of people, right? It's kind of in an essence a representative, demo representative democracy, right? But ideally in a Republican government, the people truly, truly rule over their government, right? For example, the Senate, which we'll talk about down here, technically could not make law. The only people in Rome that were allowed to make law or propose law were the people of Rome, not necessarily the senators. The senators could pass decrees that they hope people followed, but people of Rome created, issued, and had law voted upon that would pass through the Senate, right? And also the people elected their senators. They are the ones who chose them, right? So Basically, it's this idea of direct rule through the people. So you, underneath Republic, you can also write rule through the people, right? Now, other people that we can see right here, these three positions are just three important key words you're going to need to know when we're going forward so we can talk more about the Roman Republic, how it's structured and things like that, right? A consul is one of the two elected chief officials of Rome, right? Jot this down. They only ruled for a year, right? There were two of them, and they were there so they could veto one another, so that no person, one person, could actually control the entire, excuse me, the entirety of the Roman government at any point, right? So they had two consuls. There's a lot of famous consuls that we're going to end up talking about. The consulship of Sulla. We'll talk about the consulship of Gaius Julius Caesar. We'll talk about the consulship, sort of, of like Augustus, how he, now he's going to turn himself into emperor. But several different famous historical figures were all consuls at one point or another, right? Then you're going to have this other person that, of course, the reputation was started with Cincinnatus in his battles against the Achai, right? So the dictator. Now, a dictator is a, an autonomous ruler, one singular ruler that was brought in to control the Roman government, but only during times of war, right? And that was to try and streamline all their efforts to control the military and to keep Rome safe, right? The idea that they would elect a dictator during a time of war. Now, ironically enough, the dictator was pulled from one of the consuls, right? One of the consuls was made into the dictator, and then he actually ruled over the government until the war was over, because when the war was done, they were supposed to step down and give power and the ruling power back to the people of Rome, right? Now, the biggest and most powerful council that existed in the Roman government, though, was the Senate, right? It was the highest governing body in Rome. Home to several hundred people, the number would grow and grow and grow as time went on, 
basically also every time somebody was ever a consul, they would then become a senator. So as time goes on, the number of senators keeps growing. And you need to jot this down too. They ruled for life, right? They did not have to step down at any point. A consulship was only lasted for one year, but then you were guaranteed to become a senator after that because the consuls then picked all the senators, right? So big thing is though, ruled for life, right? The senators ruled for how long? Good job, Haven, for life, right? So now, really, really quick, though, to keep going forward, you also need to understand a little couple other things before we get started, okay, before we keep going any further anyway, is the 12 tables, right? Rome did have a system and code of law, all right? Now, it was known as Roman law, quote, unquote, but we refer to it in the modern era as the 12 tables, right? And the 12 tables were constructed and created right around the birth of the Republic in about circa 500 BC, right? It's a civil law that governs the daily lives of Roman citizens, okay? Now, big thing about the 12 tables, just kind of put a star next to that. We are gonna come back to it a little bit later on and it's very, very important, but they did have a system of code or a system of law, like we talked about Hammurabi's code in the past, we'll talk about Justinian's code in the future when we talk about the Byzantines, but Roman law does serve as a very important thing. Okay, so Roman law, the 12 tables. And it's actually called the 12 tables because there were several laws written on 12 separate tablets, hence tables, right? Now, there is no one constitution, though. Just because a government has a, like, a structure, a senate, a consul, and then they have all of these ethical ideas of voting and like, things like that, doesn't necessarily mean they have a constitution, okay? This is very important. Put a star next to this, okay? There was no written constitution of Rome. It's actually just a system of adopted beliefs and traditions, right? Just like especially when we're referring to the classes of Rome. Nobody ever sat down and said, you're this, you're that, and put it into writing. It's just the adopted traditions of Rome kind of delineated the fact that there were apparently two social classes, right? One was known as the patricians, which was the wealthy landowning class, right? I like to think of them like patrician, physician, right? Doctors, a lot of money, whatever. Now, the patricians, though, they led the military in times of war. They were usually military officers. They worked in the Senate, right? A lot of them would try their best to become senators, and they were the only ones that truly knew Roman law because they were the only ones that had enough money to be educated on how to read, speak, and write Latin. Well, everybody can speak Latin, but read and write in Latin, right? So the patricians were the wealthy land-owning, ruling class of Rome, right? If you were somebody that believed that you had power, then you were a patrician. But then you had the people below them, the plebeians, right? I call them plebes all the time. Now, the plebeians is the lower class, the common people of Rome. Say it with me, plebeians, but I usually insult people by calling them a plebe, right? Like, if you've got a little brother at home right now, and he annoys you later, just be like, shut up, plebe. All right, so like, but anyway, a plebeian is this common person, right? The bulk of Rome, over 90% of Rome were the plebeians, right? And they're these common people. They were farmers, soldiers, craft workers, merchants. They were the regular. They had a voice in the government, but it was a very small one. They could not be elected to office, but they could vote to get people into office, right? And here's the messed up part about it. They pay the bulk of the taxes, right? They pay the massive bulk of the taxes. And then at the very, very bottom of Roman society, was actually the slaves, right? Rome was actually home to a very, very intense slave culture, and nine times out of 10, these slaves were brought in after they took over an area, right? So where did Roman slaves come from? Usually after it was conquest, right? After they had conquest a certain area, or if they traded with certain people who actually traded in slaves, they would actually usually buy them or purchase them, and slaves were at the very, very bottom of society. But now, intensely enough, ironically, you could free yourself if you were a slave. You could work for long enough to where you actually made enough money, and you could actually free yourself yourself from your bondage and you could actually buy or purchase your own freedom right now right here though if I had to ask you what class is this is this the plebeian class or the patricians very good Ella that is exactly right those are the patricians right you can see by their lifestyle how they're eating also fun fact Romans apparently ate laying down on their stomachs which I don't feel like it would be comfortable at all it feels like it'd be like super awkward and gross. Um, but anyway so those are the patricians for sure whereas this you might say are is like it's the plebeian class right somebody because all they have are tunics and sticks now also though this man right here might have actually been a former slave because slaves actually would wear these phyllo caps after they were free to try and show that they were no longer a slave and that they were actually had been freed, right? So, but the big thing going forward though is this last thing that I need you to jot down and this is the phases of the Republican government, right? But what you can do, I need you to draw this in your notes. We're gonna go ahead and cut it off right there. I'm gonna go ahead and end it because I know this was a lot, but the big thing about it though, this is phase one of the Republican government. 
right? So this is what the Republican government looked like when we started, and then tomorrow you're going to fill this thing back in, and we're going to go over it, and we're going to explain it, but we'll talk about that stuff a little bit later on. Go ahead and pause, get this jotted down. I'll see y'all soon. Y'all have a good one.